I don't admit this very often, but I am totally intimidated by our next guest. Um, and I think if any of you uh, do some research on our next guest, you'll be totally intimidated too. Now, I'm probably going to get my analogy wrong here, but I think it's in my daughter's favorite movie, The Wizard of Oz, where the scarecrow knows he doesn't have a brain. And basically says, if I had a brain, I could think great thoughts all day. Well, I'm intimidated because I'm convinced that our next guest does that. He thinks great thoughts all day. Our next guest is Professor Robert Putnam. Uh, we're to call him Bob on the show, so he won't intimidate any of us. But I'm, and I have to read this. I'll get it wrong. He is the uh, Peter and Isabel Malkin Professor of Public Policy at Harvard University. So that's got to intimidate the hell out of you. Uh, he has consulted presidents and prime ministers, intimidating number two. Written 14 books, for those of us who have not read 14 books. <laughs> and for today, we're going to talk about his latest book, which is... Uh, our Kids, The uh, American Dream in, i got to read it upside down, American Dream in Crisis. I would say Turmoil. Crisis is crisis. his name. Uh, but here's the most intimidating of all. You know, I was doing the research for the article, and uh, there was a review of the book in the New York Times. And the author of the article refers to our guest today as the Poet Laureate of Civil Society. So if, you, if the guest on your show is the Poet Laureate of Civil Society, if that's not intimidating, in addition to everything else, I don't know what it is. So, so Bob, I'm thoroughly intimidated, but uh, welcome to the show. <laughs> don't be. I'm delighted to be here with you, Steve. Well, you've obviously written a great book, and I didn't know how to ask the first question, but I guess the first question came to me is, who is the audience for this book? Who, when you had the idea to write this book, who were you writing for? Well, maybe I should say just two words about what the argument of the book is. The argument of the book is that over the course of the last two or three generations in America, there's been a growing gap between the opportunities and, uh, op and uh, resources available to rich kids in America and the opportunities and resources available to poor kids in America. And by rich kids, I don't mean Bill Gates's kids. I mean just kids coming from the upper third of American society. That's basically anybody who's got a college degree is in the upper third of American society, and, and I'm talking about their kids, our kids, my kids, my grandchildren, they're doing fine. But over those same years, things have been getting worse and worse, not just for the very you know, homeless folks, but, but even for anybody in America who hasn't gotten past high school. That's the lower third in America. And what, what the book shows in stories, and then shows with a lot of statistics, is that over these last 30 years, things, that gap has widened. It's, there's always been a gap between rich kids and poor kids, but the gap is getting wider and wider, and that's leading us toward, frankly, a hereditary class structure in America in which the most important decision that anybody makes is choosing your parents. If you choose well-off, affluent, well-educated parents, you're fine. You're going to be fine. And if you choose uh, poor, less educated parents, no matter what your own talents and your own abilities are, you're not going to do fine. That's, I think, that's what I mean when I talk about the American dream in crisis. The American dream is that if you're, you know, you work hard and you, and you, have, you, you exploit your, your native God-given talents, you should have as good a chance as anybody in life. And you, what you, how well you do in life should depend upon your gifts and your hard work and not on what your parents did or didn't do. That is the American dream, and I think the evidence shows it's in crisis. Now, I wrote the book, really, for all Americans, for all Americans who care about public life and the future of our country. I've spoken, as you say, with a lot of leading politicians, with people who are running for president this year, and, and people who are president this year, and, and people in, in many, you know, many powerful political people. But I think because of the degree to which our political system has become block, sclerotic, that is unable to do anything, and you know as much about this as anybody, because that's what you've written about, is how blocked the political system is. In that kind of environment, real change, change that can begin to narrow this opportunity gap that I'm worried about, has to come from the grassroots, has to come from ordinary people who say, I don't want to live in an America in which we've become you know, like almost a caste society, and, and, that, and I want to do something about it. So that's what the point of the book is, to try to urge people to get off the couch and begin worrying not only about their own kids, but about other people's kids. Now, pre preparing for the interview today, I watched, I watched another interview you did with Walter Isaacson from the Aspen Institute. And you started by talking about our kids, which is the title of the book, and how the definition of our kids 
maybe isn't the same de definition when you were growing up, yeah. when I was growing up. Yeah, that's right. Um, the opening chapter of the book actually begins in my hometown, which is a small town in, in uh, northern Ohio called Port Clinton. And um, Port Clinton was not an ideal place. There was racism and, and there was sexism. This was the 1950s, after all. Um, but from the point of view of class differences and from the point of view of kids from the wrong side of the tracks getting just as good an opportunity as kids from the right side of the tracks, even non-white kids from the wrong side of the tracks had just about as good an opportunity to make a, uh, make a living and make their fortune and do well in life. From the point of view of the adults of my parents' generation, those were all our kids. When my parents used, said, you know, we've got to have a bond issue to pay for a new pool at the high school for, my, for our kids, or we've got to, you know, we need a new French department in, 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 in the high school. Let's, we've got to do something for our kids. When they used that term, our kids, they did not mean my sister and me. They meant all the kids in town. And they kept doing that when my sister and I were long gone. But if you go back to Port Clinton now, there's a huge gap between the rich kids and poor kids in town. Amazing. I mean, actually, I didn't believe how big the gap had been. There are some kids in town who are very well off and who drive BMW convertibles to the same high school that I went to. And there are other kids who've been hard hit by the, whose parents have been hard hit by the last, um, you know, 20 years of Rust Belt life and collapsing, closing factories and so on. And those kids drive to school and park next to the BMWs in jalopies that they live in. That is, they're homeless. And that, and if you talk to adults in Port Clinton now, if they're aware at all of the poor kids, the kids on the bottom side of the, of the opportunity gap in Port Clinton, now they don't, they say, that's, that's not my kids, that's somebody else's kids, let those other people worry about them. That change from our kids, meaning all the kids in town, to our kids, meaning my kids, my biological kids, that shriveling of our sense of connection with other people in town and our sense of obligation for all the kids in town, that shriveling, that shrinking, that's what's caused, fundamentally, that's what's caused this problem. I mean, there are a lot of specific causes for the growing gap that we can talk about. But underneath it all, I think what America needs to do is to begin to revert to a period in which we thought of all the kids as our kids. Because, and that's not just sentimental. I'm not just being, you know, saying, oh, isn't it too bad that these poor kids are living the way they are. My grandchildren, who are on the upside of this opportunity gap, will live a poorer life if we don't also invest in, this, in the poor kids. That is, the best estimates are that the, if we don't invest adequately in the kids living in poverty in America right now, over the course of their lifetime, they will cost all of us $5 trillion. That's trillion with a T. So it's not just altruism that makes me say we ought to worry about those kids too. I want my grandchildren who are going to be doing just fine on their own. I want them to be living in a society in which other people had opportunities too and are contributing. If the, the costs involved, in, you know, what's the downside? The costs are partly criminal justice system. They're going to be really, we're going to have to have a lot more jails if we keep going this way. Secondly, uh, health care costs because these poor, these poor kids are growing up leading in lifestyles that are going to make them get much sicker, much earlier, much longer, and we're all going to have to pay for that. But most important, we're going to lose out on their talents that they could bring to the table. And they could help enrich the whole country. As of today, there, if you compare the chances of completing, high, uh, completing college, getting a college degree, for rich, dumb kids, that is kids who don't score well on tests, but whose parents are wealthy, and poor, smart kids, that is kids who score in the top quartile of, of ability tests, but whose parents are poor, the smart, poor kids are less likely to complete college. Only 29% of them complete college compared to the rich, less smart kids. And what I'm trying to say is, by not addressing this problem, we're foregoing all of the great things that could be invented by or produced by those smart, talented kids whose only mistake was being born to parents who were poor. That's, that's, the, that's why I feel so passionately about it. It's partly that I think it's, it's awful, it's morally intolerable that we should have allowed this gap to grow as much as it has. But also, I think the country is going to be worse off economically if we don't address the problem. No, no when you talk about the American dream, the American dream was, you know, I, I can do anything. I can get an education, I can become president, whatever right. the country was. What I'm wondering is this, the, these, these kids, this generation talking about, 
do they sense this? Oh, sure. Because to me, that's even worse. There's one oh, thing yeah. to have it happen, but to have these kids sense it as though the American dream isn't for me anymore. Yeah, it's, it's actually even worse than that, Steve. Um, one of the parts of the book, in one of the parts of the book, we talk about how isolated poor kids are in America. And I mean poor kids of all races. I'm not now talking just about non-whites. I'm talking about poor kids, whatever their race. They are alone and isolated. They don't have good ties to their parents because their parents are very like, they, the, two thirds of these kids are li living in single parent homes and the homes are often quite turbulent. Some of the single moms are doing a great job trying to raise their kids, but lots of these kids are growing up in very turbulent homes. So they can't trust their parents. They can't trust the schools. They've been abandoned by community institutions. They can't trust their neighbors. These kids are alone, and they know it. They know that, and they don't trust anybody. The, there's a huge, another big gap in the level of trusting other people. Kids from affluent backgrounds tend to trust other people, but kids from these poor backgrounds don't trust anybody. And that's not paranoia. It's because they've been growing up in a world in which you can trust other people. One of the people that we interviewed happens to be a, a woman coming from the wrong side of the tracks in Port Clinton, my hometown today, recently posted on Facebook, love hurts, trust kills. Think oh. what it means. Think what it means to grow up in a society, in a circumstance in which you cannot trust anybody. And that, that they, so these kids for sure know it. They're very alienated. I don't mean they're going to start a revolution. They, they're too isolated to be able to start a revolution, frankly. But they're, they're unbelievably cynical about everything. Don't even trust your own family, Buster, is what one of them said mm -hmm. to us. And, and th I mean, let, me give you, let me give you a practical example of how this plays out in life. All kids do dumb things. Your kids, my kids, rich kids, poor kids, black kids, white kids, even in Aspen, kids do <laughs> dumb things. Right, right. But, but mine, mine only do it once every other day, not okay. every day. <laughs> well, and my kids do dumb <laughs> thing, did dumb things too, and my grandchildren do dumb things. When a child in an affluent home does a dumb thing, they drink too much or they get into drugs or they back the car into the next door neighbor's you know, garage or they, or they get in a fight with a teacher or whatever, instantly airbags inflate to protect the child from the worst consequences of that misdeed and help them learn, make it a learning experience. And I'm not even being critical. I would do the same thing if my kids. I mean, we, you know, your kid gets involved in drugs and the first thing you do is hire the best lawyer in town. And the second thing is find the best rehab facility in town. And that's what I would do if my kids got in trouble. Yeah. But then you have to shift the camera to the same thing, the same dumb thing done by a poor kid, no airbags, because they're so alone. And that means that they can't learn from experience. All that experience teaches, of their mistakes, all it teaches them is it prevents them from moving forward in life, because it's a black mark on their record. That isolation is the most fundamental and painful feature of the lives of these kids. You know, I, I was going to ask you about the no airbags because I think that's a, it's a great phrase. It just says it all in two words, no airbags. But I, I think there is some hope. We had uh, Clifton Kinney on our show yesterday. He's from Ferguson, Missouri, and uh, his, his interview will be running right around when yours run. And he woke up on that one day last August, and he decided he wanted to do something, though. Yep. So he has now started a movement with kids in his area, some college kids. So I think I think one of the things I talk about is the democracy, the internet being the greatest tool of democracy. Do you think the internet can be a tool for some of these kids, and maybe there is some hope for the, uh, this revolution that they could, well, force a conversation or something? I I want to say yes and no. I think there is hope for sure, and maybe we can talk a little bit in a second about why I'm actually hopeful that I th think we can address this problem, but. I'm a little more skeptical about the internet. I'm, in, I'm on the internet all the time, right? So I'm not like I'm, pho I'm not technophobic at all. But what the research shows is that rich kids and poor kids, kids from educated homes and kids from less educated homes, use the internet in different ways because they have the kids coming from affluent homes are surrounded by people who can t help them figure out how to use internet and internet-related facilities to help them get ahead in life, how to meet people that might have the same interest in soccer as them, how to, how to you know, track down what the best college in the country would be for them, all those ways in which it could aid their kids in, up in mobility, in upward mobility and success in life. Poor kids 
lacking, because they're so isolated, they lack anybody in their peers. They don't have peers they trust. They don't have adults in there. They don't have mentors in their lives. So they, the same physical capability that the Internet provides is not by them used in ways that can help them progress. It's used for, you know, entertainment and that sort of thing, but not for, so in a way, the Internet, which could, might have a leveling effect, doesn't as just the Internet. Now, if you could think about ways to use the Internet, but in combination with real people who could really mentor these kids and help the kids, then that might be a different story. I'm, I do think there are solutions in general to the problem, but I think um, sometimes people, when I talk about this, tech-savvy people say, oh, well, we've got an app for that. And that's what I don't think is true. I don't think you can have an app that's going to fix the, the, the plight these poor kids are in. And I was going to ask, you, so you talk about investing, and I like that word investing. And I, I think the pushback from some people might be, well, we, if you look at how much we invest, just if you added up dollars between how much we spend on education, how much we spend on after-school programs and uh, preschool programs and, and uh, charities and everything, that number would probably be a, a huge number. No, but, I, but you'd say it's not being invested the right way? Or well, no, I would say, enough? no, I mean, investing in schools is one thing, but investing in schools where poor kids live is a different thing. Okay. Increasingly, there's some big trends going on here that are important to keep in the background. The first, which people know about, is the growing income gap in America. So rich families are now really rich, and poor families, the, the people from the middle down to the bottom of the income distribution, haven't had a raise in... Long time. 30 or 40 years. So there's that income gap. Secondly, and in some respects more important, there's growing class segregation in America. So rich folks increasingly live only with other rich folks. And poor folks increasingly live only with other poor folks. And fewer and fewer of us live in moderate or mixed income neighborhoods. And what that means is that rich kids are increasingly going to school with other rich kids. And when they go to school, they bring with them their parents' aspirations, their parents' support, and their parents' money. And when poor kids go to school, they go to school with other poor kids. What they bring with them is gang violence and, and dis, you know, disruption at home and psychological problems and so on. So we're spending money on both those schools, but the problems in the, in the poor schools, which are con increasingly concentrated poverty poor schools, the, the problems there are so much greater that even if we spent the same amount of dollars, it wouldn't equal the results because the problems are just that much bigger. Um, and with respect to um, after-school activities, actually, you've now hit a point that I just get rabid about. There's a gap like this. this is, there's a whole bunch of scissors graphs in my book that show right. a growing gap between rich kids and poor kids. One of the most startling is extracurricular activities. Okay. Extracurricular activities among kids coming from well-off homes, the frequency of that is level or slightly rising, but it's sharply falling among poor kids. Taking part in high school band or football or chorus or French club or basketball, all those sorts of things that all of us did, you know, everybody in school did those things. Among poor kids in America, that rate of participation is falling dramatically. And it matters because that's the way extracurricular activities were invented in America to provide training in what we now call soft skills, teamwork and stick to and and, and all those soft skills that turn out to have value in the marketplace. Employers will pay people more if it turns out that they've been involved in extracurricular activities than the same person who hasn't been. But no, so why is the gap? Why is there a growing gap? Because school districts all across America in the last 20 years have started what they call pay to play. If you're a kid in high school now and you want to play football, your parents have got, or you know, uh, band, fees, your, parents, yeah. your parents have now got to come up with $400 on average, $400 per kid per semester. So if you've got two kids in high school and they both want to play all year, play something all year long, that's four times $400, $1,600. If your annual income is, you know, $200,000, $1,600 for your kids to take part in after school activities, that's nothing. But if your annual income is $16,000, who in their right mind is going to pay 10% of their total family income so the right. kids can play football? Right. So that it's right that we're, that we're spending money on after-school activities, but we're spending it on the have kids, and we're taking the money away from the have-not kids. Well, one of the books I read recently, I have read more than 14, by the way, <laughs> is um, a man who rapidly wrote a book, uh, uh, The uh, Smartest Kids in the World. Yeah. One of my takeaways from her book was that if, you, if she looked at Poland, for instance, the whole country, through, through some strong leadership, essentially just said, 
we are going to mobilize. Yes. We are going to get this done, and we're going to get this done in a certain period of time. You know, uh, President Kennedy said we are going to be on the moon in a certain yep. period of time. And some of your colleagues wrote, uh, if we could put a land a man on the moon uh, from Harvard, I read. Right. How do we, notwithstanding the solutions, because we want to talk about those a little, how do we just even mobilize? How do we oh. get the call to action to get right. people to say, we will not fail, and we will have a time limit. So, no, again, notwithstanding the solution, this is going to be a commitment. Well, I think, I think actually the, we can talk about the solutions, but this is not a case where we don't know what to do. I mean, there's a whole list of the last chapter here, here includes a whole list of things that we know have been proven to work to right. help poor kids. No, I think the real problem here is not that. The real problem is the shriveling of a sense of our kids and therefore a shriveling of a sense of obligation to everybody's kids, to that, that, that all kids get a fair start in life. And it is a question of political will. So I agree completely with the analysis that what it's, it's not, the debate is, is not mainly about, you know, this program, that program. It's mainly about, is this something we should worry about? And, you know, you could be, you could be pessimistic given the national political climate in America that we're in now. But let me just take a minute to describe a historical example that illustrates why I am actually, in fact, quite optimistic. Okay. At least optimistic that we could do this. Because this is not the first time that Americans have faced a situation like this. Almost exactly 100 years ago, at the end of the 19th century, in the wake of the Industrial Revolution, America had a huge gap between rich and poor. The only time, it, it was as large then as it is now, and in between, it was never as large. So that was the gold, that was the so-called Gilded Age, and the right. Gilded Age was also, that's, we live in another Gilded Age now. It was also a time of great political deadlock and corruption. And it was a time in which the, the public philosophy was what was called social Darwinism. Social Darwinism was a pseudo-scientific theory that said America would be better off if we were all more selfish. And there were big gaps between rich kids and poor kids in America around 1900. So the, it's a d close parallel to our own situation. Okay. And then within about 10, 15, 20 years, we began to fix the problem. There was a turning point, an inflection point, and we began to move America in the right direction. The best example of that, there are a lot of things involved laws about child labor and laws about wages and, and, and hours of work and many other you know, uh, uh, policy, social policy reforms. But the most interesting and relevant is in that period, in response to a problem just like the one we have now, Americans invented the high school. The high school, God did not invent the high school. The high school was invented in a particular country, America, at a particular period of time around 1910 in small towns, beginning in small towns in Kansas and Iowa and Nebraska and so on. And the idea, that was the first time in world history that communities had agreed that everybody in town, all kids in town, regardless of their class background, would get a free four-year secondary education. Now here's the pitch you had to make to people in town. In the, you know, imagine ourselves in a, in a poor town in, in Nebraska. The rich banker and lawyer and farmer had already sent their kids off to some private school and they were off in Chicago making money. And you had to go to them and say, okay, you're, what we want you to do now is you pay higher taxes so that all the kids here in town get a free secondary education just like your kids got. Now that was a kind of a hard sell as it would be a hard sell today. But it became clear to enough of those affluent people that they would be better off if all the kids in town had a, a decent education. So that, that reform spread across America pretty quickly in about 20 years. High schools were common all across America. They hadn't existed 20 years earlier. Now they did. That single policy decision accounts for almost all of American economic growth throughout the entire 20th century because what it meant was American workers were more productive and better trained than any other workers in the world. And at least for 70 years, we kind of rode on the wave of that investment. And at the same time, it leveled the playing field so that all the kids were better off. It's an ideal policy because it both raises everybody, including the, you know, the rich, rich, rich folks got richer, so they were better off, and the poor folks, were le the playing field was leveled. That mostly required those rich folks in these small towns to begin to think of the poor kids in town as also part of our kids. Now, the next question is, well, so what's the 21st century equivalent of the high school? And, I, you know, if we had more time, we could talk about my ideas for that. I think early childhood education 
is an important part of the mix. I think that community colleges are an important part of the mix. I think massive increases in, in mentoring for poor kids to begin to interrupt this tremendous isolation they face. I think massive increases in mentoring are an important part of the problem. But the, the, the fundamental issue that I want to make is not the policy wonkery, not is it this program or that program. It is that, A, we can fix the problem because we've done it before. We here have done so it, it before. So it can be fixed, right. And B, um, it, it helped all the kids in town. And helping all the kids in town helped everybody. And C, it didn't begin in Washington, and it didn't begin in Cambridge, Mass., where Harvard is. It began in small towns all across America. It began at the grassroots of America. There was a national debate. That's the Teddy Roosevelt and, yeah. and uh, Jane Addams and so on debate. And that did have effects in the long run. These ideas moved, percolated upwards from the, from the grassroots and, and eventually became pub national public policy, which is great. That's my model for how we're going to fix it this and, time. And I think that's my answer is mobilization. Mobilization is going to have to be bottom-up mobilization. Exactly. I once heard Senator Durbin speak, and I'm going to get my facts wrong, but I think he said in the first half of the last century, we built more schools, your high schools here, than had ever been built in any civilization. That's exactly but right. But in, in the la at the end of the century, we built more prisons yep. than had ever been built before. Yep. So He's right. So on every show, I give my readers a homework assignment. So not only am I going to have all, all my listeners read your book, but I'm going to make sure they drill down and find these solutions. Because I know the solutions are there. We just have to have the will to, to right. make them happen. You're a great guest. And I'm, uh, I remain in awe and I remain intimidated. Thanks. <laughs> Don't be intimidated. <laughs> just fix the problem with me. There you go. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Steve.